that I'm involved in with my center and the opportunities for young researchers to get involved in that. So let me start with the, the history. Bangladesh became uh, an independent country in 1971 uh, as a result of a, a war of independence with then West Pakistan. So we used to be part of Pakistan. Pakistan had two wings, West Pakistan uh, on one side and East Pakistan on the other. We were East Pakistan. And one of the issues of contention between the two countries or the two halves of the country was that we in East Pakistan uh, had the majority of the population, but we felt that the West Pakistanis really ruled us rather than us having a say in proportion to our population. That's an interesting and important fact because now, almost 50 years later, our population is about 160 million and Pakistan is 202 million. So the growth rate of the population in Pakistan has continued at the rate it was for many, many decades, around 3%. We were at 3%, we, we were the same country, but ours has gone down to 2% or lower. So Bangladeshi women and families and couples have had not had about 30 million babies that they could have had or they would have had. And that is my number one factor in describing how we have overcome or are overcoming poverty in, in Bangladesh. Girls' education. Girls have been educated. They have known what they need to do in terms of family planning. Information has been provided. Facilities have been provided. Um, Health care has been provided for the babies once they're born, so the survival rate goes up. Women don't have to have more babies to uh, enable a few to survive. Uh, men have been uh, given information and knowledge as well, husbands and particularly imams in mosques, uh, so that even though we are a largely Muslim uh, a country, well over 90% of the people are Muslim, um, the, the imams and the, the, the form of our Islam the, that we practice is a very moderate form of, of the religion. And in fact, that was one of the other uh, issues of contention between what was then West Pakistan and East Pakistan, and now what is Pakistan and Bangladesh. Pakistanis are much, much more fundamentalist in their Islamic tradition and, and practice, and they used to regard us Bangladeshi Muslims as not good Muslims, okay? And, and one of the reasons we fought them was that they imposed, they tried to impose fundamentalist Islam on us, which we didn't like. And so we have this uh, gut reaction against somebody imposing their view of Islam on us. In Bangladesh, you can practice Islam the way you like. If you want to say prayers five times a day, you do. If you don't, you don't have to. Women don't have to wear veils. Um, in, in the Ramadan period, the month of fasting, you can go in a restaurant and eat. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. Most people fast, but you don't have to fast. So the, the form of the practice of Islam that we have in our country in Bangladesh is a very moderate form. And within that, the issue of birth control, of women's education, these have all been accepted by society, by men, even by uh, the more uh, religiously inclined. Not that we don't have uh, fanatics, but they're very small numbers. Uh, they are uh, relatively few and they don't affect the body politic by and large. There's occasional outbreaks of terrorism, etc., that have happened, but, but compared to many other countries of a much, much a smaller nature. And so the first development breakthrough I would ascribe and, and uh, uh, attribute to the fact that we were able to educate girls, we were able to enable them to make decisions about their, their own bodies and having children, we were able to get them to go into the workplace. Uh, our biggest export earning right now, uh, by, I believe Bangladesh is now second to China only in terms of uh, garments. We make clothing, textiles, and these are now tens of millions of workers, mostly women, working in, in these factories. Not particularly good conditions, uh, they, they're not all that well paid, but they are paid, and they do get work and they get independence. And, and the emancipation of women as workers earning a living has had a very profound effect on society where these women are now decision makers with the money. And very often one of the things they do with the money is hire their husband to be a rickshaw puller. All right? So the woman buys the rickshaw, 
gets the husband to uh, ply the rickshaw during the day, and then in the evening he has to come back home and give us some money uh, uh, as the owner of the rickshaw. Uh, and and uh, so she is now in charge of the, the family uh, uh, resources and allocation of that. And one of the side effects or co-benefits of that that we see is when the woman has control over the family budget, it gets distributed in a much different way than when the man has control of it. She will spend money on the children, on their education, that gets a very high priority. Giving them good food, nutrient food for her children and her family gets a very high priority. And then, as I say, trying to help the husband uh, if possible. And, and then keeping a little bit of money uh, for herself to buy some makeup and some lipstick and some. And so there's this huge tertiary market that has grown of female um, products, hygiene and, and uh, uh, makeup products for these women who do spend this money. They, they, they spend a little bit on, on themselves, but that's not a priority. They, they have the ability to do that. And so it has a major social repercussion across uh, society in terms of, as I said, society accepting the role of women, giving them uh, uh, due space. Now, I'm not saying everything is absolutely perfect, but I am saying relative to many other developing countries, relative to many other Muslim majority countries, Bangladesh is way ahead on this idea of emancipation and equality for women and, and genuinely doing that. And as you know, uh, we have a, a prime minister now for quite a few years who is a woman and her predecessor or rival was also a woman. So uh, even in the political arena, we've had uh, uh, women playing a very significant role. Now, that to me is a, is a microcosm of one of the strands that has led Bangladesh to be able to now be in a position to graduate from being one of the least developed countries that I mentioned to graduating from that. And graduating is a formal process. This group is a UN recognized group. There are four uh, parameters that you have to sort of fulfill uh, or be below in order to be a LDC and then you have to graduate out of in order to graduate out of an LDC status. And Bangladesh has formally applied to graduate. And this, this is a formal process where this UN sends a team, they come and evaluate how well the country's been doing all these four uh, parameters. And then they allow the country to start the process. And it's a two, three year uh, review processes. So we are now in the second year of the first three years. So we'll get reviewed in another two years. And if we're all on the right track, they will be given another three years. Uh, and then at the end of that uh, period, which is around 2024, 25, we will formally graduate out of a least developed country status. And this is something that the government is very proud of. It's, it's, uh, it's being promoted quite widely. In fact, many people in Bangladesh think we've already graduated, which we haven't actually, but, but the rhetoric is very much we are graduating uh, and that's seen as, a, as an issue of pride uh, across the board in the country. And um, I won't go into all the other details of what's happening at the political level or at the sort of private sector uh, development level. Uh, I just wanted to just make this case that Bangladesh relative to other least developed countries, other uh, Muslim majority countries um, is doing relatively better. Um, than many of them and is on a positive track. Not to say that there aren't negative aspects to it. I often characterize Bangladesh's progress as being two steps forward and one step back. And that's how we, we make progress. The, the, the trick is to learn when you're in a backward step how you stop it at one step and regain momentum going forward. And that's not easily done. And so we have to be careful about when we're in a backward situation, how do we stop that uh, regression and move it back to uh, a positive forward uh, position. Um, just to give you an example uh, that you're familiar with, the UK right now is in a backward step. Okay, so <laughs> we're, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to get out of this, and so for the US as well. Trump is a backward step for the United States of America, and they're going to have to figure out how they stop him at one term or less than one term and regain momentum going forward. So this is a universal phenomenon everywhere, and, and, and it's equally true for Bangladesh. Uh, but we somehow, as a society, are managing to do this. Okay, uh, absorb. Uh, backwardness and absorb negativity, try and overcome them and go forward. 
So this now moves me to the second uh, story that I want to share with you, which is the climate change story. So Bangladesh, as the climate change issue emerged, and, and I'll, I'll make this personal in that um, at that time, in the 80s, I was based in Bangladesh. I ran a, a, a research institute called the Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, one of the leading environment-related uh, uh, research institutes, non-governmental. Um, and we, we worked broadly on environmental issues. But in the early 90s, I was invited to join some international studies looking at climate change, which for us, or me in particular, was something new we hadn't done before, looking at potential sea level rise globally. It was part of a global study where we were asked to look at the Bangladesh one. And in fact, one of the earliest papers in 1989 on uh, sea level rise in Bangladesh is something I wrote with a colleague, Iqbal Ali, uh, in 1989, which is often re recited in, in many IPCC reports as the one that shows Bangladesh uh, three, uh, one, one quarter of the country going underwater if you dry, draw a straight line, uh, one meter sea level rise. <coughs> it's obviously much more complicated than that. But that's when it started. And so we started getting involved, I personally and, and my team, uh, in looking at climate change impacts in particular on vulnerable countries. And that's when I started working more and more on climate change impacts, not just in Bangladesh, but in vulnerable countries more broadly. Um, and then I moved to the UK and I joined IID uh, to develop their program on climate change, which was largely on uh, dealing with it, uh, climate change impacts in the most vulnerable countries. So most of my work has been working with the most vulnerable countries, as I said, in the negotiations with their delegations, negotiating uh, the UNFCC process, and then at the national level with the countries, with the governments, with NGOs and academics, uh, helping them understand the problem of climate change and how it's going to affect them and what they can do about it. And in that context, one of the things that I, I started in IID and, and my colleagues there now continue um, is uh, trying to bring together uh, what we call a community of practice working on what we call community-based adaptation, working with the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries, but now increasingly also in developed countries. There are vulnerable communities even in developed countries like the UK and the US. Um, and one of the things we've been doing over the years is holding an annual conference on community-based adaptation uh, uh, where we bring together several hundred uh, people from all over the world who work on this issue, many of them NGOs, development NGOs like Oxfam and CARE, uh, many academics including from IDS have been to these meetings. Uh, the next one is going to be held actually in exactly 10 days from now, uh, from the 1st to the 4th of April, is going to be in Addis Ababa in uh, Ethiopia and it's the 13th in the series. So we've been running these now for 13 years. Uh, in various countries. Last year it was in uh, Malawi, the, the year before that in, in uh, Uganda, and we've held it in Bangladesh a number of times as well. Um, and so we bring together, as I said, uh, this community of practice, increasingly including researchers, increasingly including uh, government officials, uh, uh, and looking at how can we support this growing uh, action-oriented activity amongst vulnerable communities who are not sitting idle and are working towards uh, tackling climate change. And that brings me to how that has happened in my country, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh has realized and has been you know, told by the very first IPCC report that it is one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. And there have been many different kinds of studies, global rankings of uh, uh, vulnerability to climate change, depending on how the rankings are done and how, how much weight is given for any particular impact of climate change. Bangladesh is either number one or number two or number three on almost every list. Um, and because of our geography, we are a very low-lying country on three of the biggest rivers of the world, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and the Meghna, uh, susceptible to sea level rise, have regular cyclones, regular floods, and part of the country is also drought prone. So almost all the climate change impacts uh, are, are hitting the country in some way. And so this knowledge is something we knew about some time ago, and we have now been acquiring our planning process of what are we going to do about it. And that's really what I want to share with you. So in 2009, uh, the government of Bangladesh, with its own resources, the Ministry of Finance, uh, um, commissioned a, a set of Bangladeshi experts 
to develop what <laughs> became known as the Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. This is before any other country had done this. Right? Bangladesh by itself with no donors, and it is not a, a donor-funded program, it was uh, initiated and supported by the government itself. With Bangladeshi experts, I was one of them. We came up with this thing called the Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. It had six pillars and about 40 different actions identified in it, and the government adopted that. And not only adopted it, the finance minister, as I said at that time, who was very much behind this when it was presented to him, said, we, if this is so important for us, we cannot afford to wait for the rest of the world to come to our rescue. We are going to have to do something about it ourselves. And from that day on, the finance minister started putting $100 million a year equivalent in Bangladeshi currency into his national budget every year to implement the Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. And this was set up as something called the Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund, which, interestingly enough, uh, as an anecdote to show you how this has evolved over time, this was done by a previous government. And then we had uh, elections and we, we got this current uh, uh, government in power. It's called the Awami League. They came in. They didn't like the previous government and changed a lot of the policies of the previous government, but not on climate change. On climate change, they adopted it. They tweaked it so that they then, you know, had it, it was their version of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention the difference between the old version and the new one in a minute. Uh, but then they adopted it themselves and the new finance minister, uh, he then started putting $100 million a year into the budget for the last seven, eight years. Um, and so Bangladesh has been putting in nearly a billion dollars of its own money into implementing hundreds of projects on adaptation, mainly on adaptation to climate change, a few on mitigation as well, uh, through government. So 90% of the money was allocated to the government, 10% was allocated for NGOs and civil society that also uh, did a lot of community-based adaptation work in, in, in civil society-led activities around the country. Just to go back to the, the difference between the two versions of the report, the original version of the report did not mention at that time, this is 2009, the issue of climate change induced migration. The new version did. So the, in, in the second time around, uh, it, it was flagged as an issue. It wasn't worked out in terms of what are we going to do about it, but it was flagged as something that we need to think about. Right now, we, we are now 10 years through that plan. It's now being revised, and, and the, the same team of six uh, authors have been asked to um, uh, work on the revision. And we've submitted our, our inputs to the government. They are now putting it together. Hopefully, it will come out fairly soon. But essentially, there are three things that are new to the new version. It, the timeline now goes to 2030. The second issue is how we, we mainstream climate change into national development. So instead of having a separate pot of money, a separate plan, a separate set of activities, those are now done. They have enabled us to build our own capacity across different sectors, across different government agencies, across non-government agencies to understand what it means for us and what we need to do about it. So now we are mainstreaming it into everything. And so in our new planning process, we, we do a set of five-year plans, and then we have a plan to 2030, and then we have recently done something called the Delta Plan that goes to 2100, uh, which is fairly unusual following the Dutch, who, who are the first to do this. But this planning process is now a, a, a ball that is already rolling, and within this now, the idea is to mainstream climate change into the national planning and into the national budget. So Bangladesh now has a climate change budget. This money that we used to come in the form of this separate uh, um, trust fund will now go into the national budget itself. The last budget had about 8% of its budget allocated across all 20 different ministries to tackling climate change within those ministries going forward. And similarly, uh, uh, NGOs and others are also uh, being tasked with in incorporating climate change. So mainstreaming climate change is the order of the next uh, 10 years to 2030. And one of the uh, corollaries of this uh, strategy of mainstreaming is it requires a huge amount of capacity building uh, because people need to know what to do. Some of them have learned, so the, the initial period has been very useful in some learning, but that learning now needs to percolate across society uh, um, uh, all over the place, and that's something that we are working on. And so I'll, I'll now come to the third and last part of my uh, storytelling, which is what we in universities in Bangladesh are doing. 
universities being uh, uh, repositories of learning in a country. Um, Bangladesh has more than 100 universities, both public and private. So that's millions of students. Um, not all very good, they, they vary in quality obviously, uh, but now within that sector, universities, research institutes, etc., we have uh, over the last few years been bringing everybody together. We're now uh, well over 50 institutions in a, a program or a platform called Gobeshana. Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research. Uh, we have a web portal which you can uh, access if you want to have a look at it. One of the things we do there is we actively collect uh, scientific papers that are written, uh, published on climate change in Bangladesh. They have to be both climate change and Bangladesh for us to select them. If they're only climate change but not Bangladesh, we don't select. Or if they're Bangladesh but not climate change, we don't select. I think the latest number is well over two and a half thousand papers in a searchable database which you can search by topic, author, year, whatever. Um, it, takes, it gives you the abstract and a link to the paper. If the, link, if the paper is public domain, you can download it. If it's behind the paywall, you have to get it. We can't give you the paper. But it gives you access to that information. Uh, we also do a monthly seminar, which is hosted uh, every month by one of the partner institutions where researchers come and present their work. Um, and then we do an annual conference every January, which we've been doing for the last five years. Um, it's growing in, in, we get several hundred people coming over four days. Uh, we do a three-day science conference where uh, over different themes, uh, researchers present their work. And then the fourth day is what we call a science policy dialogue day where we bring policymakers and we from the research community provide them with uh, uh, what we feel are important research outcomes that they need to take into account. And now that we've done it for five years, we use this as a means of measuring our progress. So each year we assess where we are, we try and make uh, uh, um, uh, directions, particularly getting feedback from policymakers in terms of what kind of research would help them in the decisions that they are going to have to take. And so it feed, it's a feedback loop for us to do more demand-driven research, which we then next year can report back on to them in terms of what we were able to do or not able to do in many cases. And then each year we do this. So it's a, it's a means of uh, assessing and moving up the knowledge curve as a collective uh, government of Bangladesh, people of Bangladesh, where are we in, in our knowledge and learning in this process. And so next year in January 2020, we are going to make this event into a global event where we are going to invite the rest of the world to come and learn from Bangladesh and also we would like to learn from the rest of the world in what they are doing and, and sharing what they are doing uh, with us. So um, these are just a number of elements that in my view present a very uh, forward uh, looking, um, not entirely smooth, there are always uh, you know, setbacks in this process, but looking at them overall we have made a tremendous amount of progress. And looking at them particularly in the global context, Bangladesh is, I, I am going to assert, well ahead of the rest of the world. So I'll just give you an example. Yesterday I was in Brussels for a day invited by the DG Klima, uh, the Directorate of Climate Change in, in, uh, um, in Brussels at the Commission who invited a, a whole bunch of people to work on adaptation. So Europe's adaptation, they're going to develop an adaptation program for Europe. And the discussions that they were having, I said, this is stuff we've had 10 years ago. Right? You guys are 10 years behind. You need to come to Bangladesh and see what we can do, particularly in mainstreaming. So you, know, you start off with it being a separate thing. You have to learn about it. You'd have to go through that step. But so once you learn, you realize that just doing isolated adaptation is not going to do much to tackle climate change. You're going to have to put it in. How do you mainstream it? How do you then bring the whole of society together to tackle a global problem? And Bangladesh is doing that. We have the whole of society, 160 million people, who are very well aware of the problem and who in many, many different sectors are each of them developing their strategies to deal with the problem across the board. And I'm talking millions of people, from the farmers to the fishermen to the researchers to the policy makers and to the finance ministries putting the money in. And so um, let me end by inviting any of you who are interested in doing research. And I quite regularly get uh, students from IDS uh, coming, and I know there are a number of Bangladeshis uh, who are studying here in IDS as well. So for the non-Bangladeshis who may be interested, and I can see uh, a former student here uh, uh, who has been to Bangladesh a number of times and, and worked there a lot. So 
please do, if you're interested, to come to Bangladesh. Get in touch with me. Um, I'd be very happy to uh, uh, advise. And, and if you want to come and spend some time at my center, we have a visiting researcher program uh, that you're most welcome to apply to and, and come. We can't give you any money. You'll have to pay for yourselves. But we can, we can help you uh, find something very interesting to do there. And I guarantee you will find it very, very interesting. I'll stop there. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Salim. Um, a fascinating story about a, a journey, as you called it, from somebody who has been very close to it, and I suspect has had a hand in some of these, uh, not, not uh, just a few of these developments as well. So um, we'll uh, open up the floor um, for questions now and, and comments and reflections. But before that, I just want to say, um, you know, obviously a lot of the work, uh, what you're saying, resonates with work we have at IDS and Sussex, and we've been lucky to have uh, collaborations mm -hmm. with you as well, and, and uh, a current project where we look at what transformation looks mm -hmm. like, or what mi might it look like in practice. And I can echo what he says about, you know, the world can learn a lot from Bangladesh in the, in the sense of, well, the challenges you had, mm -hmm. it's like a microcosmos of every challenge you can imagine <laughs> on, on climate change, but also the commitment of the government and the trust fund you mentioned and, and um, the sort of ownership the government has shown. And I, I suspect uh, our lecturer has had a hand in that as well. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that, those insights. So uh, let's open for questions. So. Um, um, when you, just to say, when you, uh, if you can introduce yourself and where you're from, and um, yeah, uh, before you ask questions. Hello, Mr. Halim. I'm Atika. I actually contacted you a few months back about the BCCTF and mm -hmm. BCCRF, the mm -hmm. two funds that are being implemented, that were being implemented in Bangladesh, and I found it very interesting, like how the amount of BCCTF fund is increasing every year, and how the donor-funded BCCRF was not used uh, even half mm -hmm. of uh, of the available funds uh, because of a lot of issues found during the implementation. I was wondering whether it's, still, it's also the case for other donor-funded funds that I didn't have the chance mm -hmm. to look at. And then also for the future, I understood that Bangladesh is really focusing on adaptations. Is Bangladesh also looking at mitigations more in the future? Thank you. I wonder if we should take a few take questions a few. Okay. and then we can we just yeah. make a point. I see a few other hands. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Fiona Duby, and I worked for the British government in Bangladesh for quite a number of years in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it really is a testament to, to the resilience and recovery of, of this country. My question is about um, recognizing that the garment industry has made enormous changes, which you have described already. Um, but globally speaking, um, the garment industry in fashion is being um, hailed as being one of the biggest mm -hmm. threats to climate change. So what is Bangladesh going to do if the garment industry is going to be reduced and this will affect employment of women there. Is Bangladesh preparing for that? Um, because they're certainly making a contribution to, to this problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, I have a, a, two questions. Uh, first one is, um, is about uh, how you make sure that uh, investment in climate change and environmental and environmental problems uh, mainstreaming is translated into development because uh, most of the time the Minister of Environment uh, find, find it very hard to convince the Minister of Finance that uh, investment in the environment is something of doing. Second one is to see how do you monitor the mainstreaming process in your country? How do you monitor the progress? Thank you very much. Yeah, let me do that. Thank you very much. So um, let me start with the, the first question on the two funds. So we had two funds. One was our own fund with our own money that I mentioned earlier. It's called the Climate Change Trust Fund. And then there was a separate fund created for donors to put money into called the Climate Change Resilience Fund. Um, that particular fund, so the, the, the good thing about the two funds was that
they were not set up to, to fund different things. They were set up to fund the same climate change strategy and action plan, just putting money in from two sources. The other big difference between the two was that the national fund had a governance structure that was entirely national. So it was the different ministries of the government with some outside experts who then uh, allocated, there was a technical committee that uh, received proposals, allocated resources uh, to projects and activities. And, and the, with the uh, BCCRF, the, 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 the donor fund, a number of countries, including the UK, put substantial amounts of money into it in the hundreds of millions over the years. It was managed by the World Bank. And that really was a, a major issue because the World Bank was um, effectively forced to reduce its commission from a normal 15% commission to 5% which they then lost interest in managing this. And it was a very badly managed uh, fund, the donor fund, by the way. And in the end, it was so bad that the bank decided to close it. There was still money left in it. They decided, we're not going to do this anymore. So as of 31st December, two years ago, we're going to close it. And any money left over, we're going to give back to donors. And that went down very badly with donors because no donor likes getting money back. They gave it three years ago to you to spend and now you're giving them money back. You know, the DFID in Dhaka didn't know what to do with it. Uh, the Australian aid agency didn't exist anymore. So who are they going to give it to? Okay. <laughs> The, it, it was a major headache, even though, although the amounts were not huge, it caused a lot of problems for the donors and they did not like that at all. And it was the bank's mismanagement of it. So it, the, the two had a very different and distinctive uh, heritage. And that's over now, that's killed. The, the trust fund continues, the government is still putting money into that. Um, on, on the garments, you're very right, and this is something that uh, is, is realized, so it's not as if it's escaped our attention. And various kinds of thoughts and processes are going into it. I'll mention a couple. In the whole world, the number, the, the top, of the top 15 garment industries that have full green certification, LEED certification, eight out of 15 are Bangladeshi factories. These are Bangladeshi factory owners who have taken the trouble and invested money in going green, looking at their water use, looking at their energy use, looking at the use of dyes and chemicals, the pollution, and got certification to be green. Whereas they don't actually get a premium in price. They have to give the product at the same price as factories that aren't green. Um, but nevertheless, they've done it because they realize that this has reputational value for them. And similarly, in the garment uh, uh, industry more broadly, particularly in the fashion part of the industry, there's a lot of very good uh, new practices, for example, by BRAC and by Grameen uh, uh, Bank as well, at designing fashion that is green, that is less environmentally disruptive, less uh, carbon footprint, and be fashionable with it. Okay, so it's not just cheap, it's, it's nice and good to look at, but it's also environmentally friendly as well. And there are a number of boutiques that are beginning to push this as well. So um, it doesn't solve everything, but it, it shows that there is a awareness of the problem and a willingness to engage with solving the problem. And in fact, one of the, the biggest um, if you like, psychological or paradigm shifts that we are hoping to achieve with this shift from being a least developed country to a non-least developed country is the realization that we need to be doing things better. So we've done them all right, but we haven't done environmentally or socially. Uh, there, there are many, many different parts of the development a pathway that we have not done well on. We need to be, do much better on them in the next phase of our work and do it ourselves and not be aid dependent in doing it as well. So that realization is now beginning to happen. The, I would say it's not widespread, it's not across the entire industry, but it's an, across a number of them that can make a difference and they will make a difference over time. I, I do believe that. Um, in terms of the investment, one of the things you pointed out with the ministries of environment is a, is a global problem everywhere. Uh, climate change arose as an environmental issue. It sat within environment ministries or departments in government, and it can't be solved in that department. Right? That department cannot solve climate change. 
It's usually a regulatory department. It has pollution laws and it imposes pollution, but it can't change climate change. Climate change is about changing the whole country, the lifestyle of the country. So you need at some point in time to realize that that's not working. They aren't the people who can do it. They need to be, it needs to be taken out by the president, the prime minister, the finance minister, the planning minister. It needs to be taken up at a very, very high political level and not at a, uh, a low environment only issue level. And that's what I'm talking about in Bangladesh, happened 10 years ago. And the Ministry of Finance is now the leader on climate finance. The planning ministry is the leader on planning and integrating climate. They don't need the environment ministry to tell them what to do. These guys know what they're doing now. That's what I mean by mainstreaming. And it's capacity building, it took time. It took time to build that capacity, but now the capacity exists and now we can unleash that capacity in terms of uh, um, putting that in. The, the last point you mentioned is a very good one and, and where we've been weakest. So another aspect of the new uh, strategy and action plan that I mentioned is an emphasis on this which we didn't have before, which is monitoring. All right, so we spent a lot of money, we gave a lot of projects, some good came out of it, but we're not good at monitoring how effective that was in terms of the objective of tackling climate change. Um, and now, now we need to do m much better at that. So we're putting more resources into thinking about how do you monitor uh, uh, climate change investments more effectively, and in particular, the, um, uh, the difficulty arises in adaptation to climate change. It's very complicated. It looks like development. How do you divide adaptation from development? So you, we need to think of new metrics of finding ways to, um, uh, to measure what we are doing most effectively. And, and let me just also mention in, in, in our research uh, capacity in my center in Bangladesh, we are part of a network of research institutes working on this issue, including ideas. We belong to the camp where we focus on adaptive capacity of people is the main issue. What we're trying to do is to make people with knowledge and experience more adaptive. And to us, that's half the battle. It's not about building new infrastructure. It's not about developing policies. It's more about enabling everybody, including the farmer and the fisher, to understand what this issue is and how, it, how am I going to cope with this issue. And then look for others' assistance, top-down assistance from you know, either national governments or global uh, funds or uh, processes, but be bottom-up dependent. And, and the community of practice on community-based adaptation, which I mentioned, which is now many, many thousands strong, is that community of practice of the most vulnerable communities learning how to tackle climate change in real time, on the ground, uh, and, and again, something that the rest of the world can learn from the developing countries, uh, Bangladesh just being one example of many where this is taking place. Thank you. So let's have another round of questions. Um, I can see a hand there, and Olivia, and, and there's, yeah, online questions as well. Okay, great. So we'll take three, three more, is that right? Uh, hi, I was, um, uh, we're on the climate change course and we were just hearing about um, uh, climate change migrants, and you mentioned it briefly there. Um, I wonder where you stood personally on whether these people should be um, classified as uh, refugees or as climate change migrants. I know that's a bit of an issue in the UNFCCC at the moment. I think it was straight. Uh, well, uh, Just a reminder to tell you who you are. And, uh, where okay. you so, yeah. I'm Madhu. I'm from Centre for Development Studies, Kerala in, in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, it's you know very important topic uh, you're speaking. But sir, you know I have some little doubt because you're taking the poverty and the climate change. And what I understood that you know is sometimes it's uh, getting opposite that you want to you know you know bring of people out of from the poverty at the same time the climate. So because in India also the manufacturing, you know, then the which is you know, most of the you know, research paper indicate that you have to expand the manufacturing, then the climate at the risks. So sir, you know, in Bangladesh, I don't know, could you give me some example? It's not the you know, allocation of money, but the implementation part. Could you give me some few examples how the implementation of the design that because we, in the research you can have you know, but the implementation in the ground has a lot of you know other consequence like migrations so if you could give you know some uh, example that would be great thank sure. you okay. I think next was Olivia over there. Uh, 
thank you for that talk. Um, I feel more optimistic in many ways about, about the world afterwards. Um, That's the idea. <laughs> great. <laughs> my name is Olivia. I'm a PhD student. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just comment on the kind of governance characteristics of Bangladesh that you think have sort of led to some of these strides forward, um, whether this is a case of strong leadership at the right moment or champions, or if there's something more systematic driving these changes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I'll start with the, the last one, which is a very challenging one. And I have to be very careful. This is being broadcast, you know. So. Um, Governance is always a key, right? So let me characterize the climate change prob problem globally as well as nationally uh, in, in governance terms. It is, I think, a very legitimate formulation of the problem, globally and locally, of the rich harming the poor, okay? So you and I are the emitters, but the victims are people in Beira today. A thousand people died. 90% of the city has disappeared in the last 48 hours. They are victims of climate change, right? And that is a matter of global great injustice, right? That we have to recognize and we have to deal with. And it's true at the national level as well as at the global level. And so at the national level, one needs to always fight for the voices of the most vulnerable which are usually not taken into consideration, how do you get them taken into consideration? And the role of the researcher, to me, is a very normative role. It is the purpose of the research is to empower the most vulnerable. It's not to be neutral and say, well, if you can do this or you can do that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about that kind of research. My research question is, are, is your research going to help the most vulnerable or not? If it's not, then it's not much use to me. Right? And so you can be normative, you can do rigorous research, right? And uh, you can find that it's not helping, or some things are being done in the name of doing helping, but they don't help, which is fine. That's, that's a legitimate outcome of research. But the purpose of research is to rectify an imbalance in governance between those who have power and those who don't. Because those who have power are the ones causing the problem for those who don't. It, that's a, a very simple characterization of what climate change globally is. It's rich harming the poor. Absolutely, no question about that. The question then is how do we rectify it? Um, and so in the context of Bangladesh, um, to answer your question more sort of at a, at a final level, it has been a leadership, very much so. The prime minister, our prime minister, can give you a very, she can give this speech herself without notes. She knows it all. She's very, very knowledgeable. Our finance minister, who has been putting 100 million a year into the, the budget, he is an environmentalist. He's not, he's not the finance minister anymore, but he was until very recently. Um, and he is extremely knowledgeable. These are finance, planning ministries. So as I said, this is not just the environment ministries or, min, or, or people. This is very much a cutting edge issue across society. Uh, if you, you know, come to a, a, a Bangladesh and you stay in a hotel and you talk to the waiter, the waiter can talk to you about climate change. He knows about climate change, she or she. And so this is something the awareness level is very, very high. What we have been trying to do is what I call moving from awareness of a problem to knowledge of solutions. That's a, not a, a simple step because when you, awareness of a problem can be common for everybody. We all know floods, droughts, cyclones, okay, it's going to affect us all. Solutions then depends on who we are, where we live, okay? Um, if you live in Brighton, you have a particular problem. If you live in London, you have a particular other kind of problem. You need to figure out what it is. You're a student, you have one kind of problem. You're a teacher, you have another problem. You work for the government, you have another thing to do. So it's who you are, where you live, that defines what kind of solution, actions, you can take to deal with the problem. The problem is a common problem for everybody, but it, it differs from place to place and people to people. And therefore, what you need to do to tackle the problem then becomes disaggregated to many different people who need to learn. Once they learn, they can take collective action together. And that's really what I'm describing is happening in my country in Bangladesh. Okay? And all countries have to do this, and all countries are, are on the way to making this happen. Um, with regard to an example of, of poverty versus uh, climate change, let me share with you something that uh, has happened in Bangladesh uh, on the mitigation side. Right? Bangladesh now has five million households with solar home systems uh, that are put in place 
and that is supplying energy, uh, some energy to 20 million poor households, mostly rural, uh, which the grid electricity has not been able to reach for the last 50 years. Okay? They're, they're poor, they're off the grid, but they now have a solar uh, panel, they have a battery, they, they can now control the energy that they have in the battery. They, the number one reason for buying it and the number one use is children's education. So the kids tell their parents, how can I do my homework in the evening without a light, with the little kerosene lamp, I can't read. Next door they have a lamp, they have a light, you know? so I need a light. That's why the parents go out and they buy it. One of the other reasons why at a, at a more uh, national level of the, the breakthroughs that allow this to happen, because there's a lot of solar panel donations over the years that then go bad and nobody knows how to fix them. They're lying all over the country, in many countries, including in India. Um, the, big, the two big uh, innovations in, in policy and practice was to provide a, set up a pri public-private partnership company, it's called it called the Infrastructure Development Company Limited, which then franchised about 25 to 30 companies, different parts of the country, to give them uh, um, low interest loans in, to enable them to provide the services. So what they then do is they give a loan to the buyer because the, for solar energy, there's upfront capital cost, which hardly anybody can afford. But if you get a loan to pay it, you pay it, you buy it, and then you repay the loan over time. And the, the formulation of the, the repayment is that the repayment is a weekly repayment, is effectively just under what they used to pay for kerosene. So they're actually not paying extra. Uh, they used to buy kerosene every week. Now, instead of buying kerosene, they're paying, paying off the, uh, the unit. But, and then the other part of the innovation was the after-sales service, because as I said, something goes wrong. If there's nobody to fix it, then the thing is not much use to you. But now, something goes wrong, you phone, and everybody has a mobile phone in Bangladesh, by the way. They can call up the, the supplier, the supplier comes. They, if they can fix it immediately, they fix it. If they can't fix it, they replace it and go away. So you have reliable after-sales service, which gives them confidence to buy the unit. It's expensive for them to buy. Um, and then they allocate the, the uh, available uh, uh, energy. So I was just sharing this with Lars. One of the byproducts, if you like, or co-benefits of this is that the energy stored in the battery is a finite amount of energy. During the day, the sunlight shines, the battery gets charged. Most of the use is going to be in the evening after sunset. Now, the lady of the house is in charge of this unit. And she now starts figuring out how much energy do I have and how many things can I do with this. I can run a fan for four hours. I can charge the phone, another big reason for having it, uh, for a couple of hours. The children need to study in the evening. They need two hours of light. And then we have a television. We want the favorite television program. At a certain time, we need enough energy to watch that uh, program. And she starts making this. And she's very, very good at doing that. She allocates this resource, this limited resource that they have of energy stored in a battery across the usage within the family. It's like money, as I said earlier, for the garment uh, worker. This is energy use in a, in a rural household. And these five million households, five million women, are now empowered. They're making decisions on an allocation of a resource that they didn't have before. And now they're able to do that. So these are, you'd have to look for the win-wins. I'm not saying that there aren't uh, win losses. There, there are trade-offs in some cases as well. But there are many, many win-wins in terms of looking at poverty and tackling climate change together. They, they can help each other. They reinforce each other most of the time rather than uh, negate each other. Should we take yes. some more? Um, we can take another round. I, I, I know some people have asked online and maybe waiting for answers, so maybe take a few of those. Um, and then we'll do another round in the audience. Yeah, there's just one online. So okay. this is from right. Flavia online. Uh, what is the current situation and main reason for climate change induced migration in Bangladesh? Oh, I didn't answer the migration. And how does the strategy and action plan address this issue? Sure, okay. Shall we take a couple more in the yeah. audience? I can't remember who was first. I think Same. maybe you're on the back there, and then Avni um, on that side. Hi, my name is Clara. I'm an exchange student within international development and anthropology. And I'm wondering what role, role is the civil society playing in the work against climate change, and how do, we, do they cooperate with the government and the mm -hmm. funds? Then there was a question there. Okay. Um, 
Hi, sir. I'm Avni. I'm doing MSc uh, in climate change, and I'm from India. Um, so, sir, in, uh, you started your talk with women and the emphasis that uh, the role that education and awareness and family planning has played uh, the role for the women. So, I want to know how the rights of women get impacted because of climate change in Bangladesh and how are programs being used to counter those rights, to fulfill those rights? Because in India, that's not happening. Every five years, we get a water program or some program, and it does not tackle the issue of water scarcity and its impact on women. So, how is Bangladesh doing that? Sure. Should I take that? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, I, I apologize for not having addressed the issue of migration in, uh, that was asked earlier, but I'll do the, the two questions together. So, in the context, so it, broadly in the context of the use of terminology, migrants, refugees, climate migrants, okay, these things have um, connotations associated with them. They have um, bodies of discourse associated with them. A refugee is defined under the Geneva Convention. There's a UN High Commission for Refugees that takes care of them once they're defined as refugees. Internally displaced are not refugees. They have to cross a border to become a refugee. Internally displaced, they are internally displaced, the responsibility of whatever government is in charge of that particular country. Migrants is a much broader term. They can be economic migrants, they can be environmental migrants, they can be migrant migrants who come for pull factors, jobs, economic opportunities, push factors, they lose their livelihood or they lose their house to river erosion or to a cyclone, and then they're forced to move. In the climate change context, I'll speak now for the UNFCC process, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We categorize this issue under what we call forced displacement due to climate change. And this falls in the UNFCC process under something called loss and damage. Okay, so we have in the UN, UN Framework Convention process, the way we describe the climate change problem, we start with emission reduction, which is mitigation, and then we do dealing with the impacts, which is adaptation or preparing for the impacts of adaptation. And now we are in what we call loss and damage. The, the floods that just took place in Mozambique, the damage has happened. You know, there's no more for, room for adaptation there. They have lost lives and damaged property that somebody needs to help them uh, and compensate them for. So in the UN Framework Convention, we have a, something called the Warsaw International Mechanism on loss and damage, under which displacement due to climate change is an issue that we are now beginning to adopt. So in the last conference of parties in Katowice in Poland, we have now adopted, a, there was a task force set up to come out with a report, we've adopted the report, and we have recognized for the first time that such a thing as climate migrants will happen. We don't call them climate migrants, by the way. They are forcibly di displaced because of climate, okay? And that they will grow in future. The numbers are going to be quite staggering. So we need to start planning about it, okay? This has now happened at the global level in terms of the discourse. But, and, and they have, the discourse has been in, in parallel. They're now beginning to uh, come together. At the national level, what we have been thinking about doing um, is something that uh, we are promoting and getting more and more people to uh, buy into. The government has not officially uh, adopted this, is what we are calling climate resilient, migrant friendly towns, secondary towns. Uh, we estimate that in Bangladesh, mainly from the coastal, uh, low-lying coastal area, in the order of 10 million people over the next 10, 20 years are going to have to leave. They will be forcibly displaced because of uh, climate change. Um, if we don't do anything about it, they will all end up in Dhaka City. Dhaka City is already the fastest growing mega city in the world, 16, 17 million people, another 10 million people, we don't know what we'll be able to do with them. But we can't force them to not come. So we, but we can enable them, make opportunity for them to go elsewhere. So we have identified about a dozen towns uh, of about a half a million to a million people, which can then take on another half a million to a million people each in those towns. We have to create the economic conditions, the educational facilities, the health facilities to attract these migrants to go there and enable them to go there. And the third leg, which is critical and it speaks to the question raised about women, is because of this timeline, we are not talking about the 
fishers and the farmers who are living there today. For them, we have to help them adapt uh, and deal with the problem. But we're talking about their children, particularly their girls. If we can educate their girls and their boys, and those boys and girls get educated and get job opportunities in these towns where we create the jobs for them, then they take their families when they want to take their families. So they move when they want to move. They become, they become the decision makers of when they have to move, not somebody else, not a planner, not somebody telling them that they have to move. And the question now is, how do we make that happen? All right? And it is, it is much less about physical infrastructure, it's much more about psychology. All right? And the biggest psychology breakage is, is global. It happens every country that has migrants. Host population versus migrant population. Host population don't like migrants. Okay? How do we make the host population like migrants? They can be fellow citizens. How do we make the migrant have a path to citizenship? A, pos a positive path to citizenship. And it's about changing mindsets, about, about people changing their minds, not money. It's about looking at another person as a human being, not as an other, okay? which is very, very difficult nowadays. Uh, but, but I'll give you one, one uh, positive example in the case of Bangladesh, which I'm sure you're aware of. In the last year, Myanmar has thrown out a million Muslims Rakhine um, people in Rakhine province in Myanmar. They're not climate migrants, they're political migrants. They got thrown out, they came to Accra. Initially we tried to stop them at the border but then our prime minister said, you know, the, 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 we can't stop them, let them in. Let them in, they came in, one million. This is a year ago. We have housed them, we have given them medical assistance. Many of the women were pregnant, they have babies every day in, in the camps. We are feeding them. We are providing them with clothing, with schools for their children. If you look at a satellite image of that region of the country, it's a forest region in the southeastern part. A year ago, it was a forest, tropical forest with elephants, wild elephants running up and down. Now, it's the fourth largest city in the world and the biggest refugee camp in the world, Kutupalong refugee camp, huts on hills, a million people living there. The elephants are still going through because we built a camp on the elephant path. So right now we have a program which is actually quite a successful program of putting a, a barrier around that end and then huts to try and get the, the elephants to go around the camp instead of go through the camp. Initially they went through the camp and they killed a few people initially. So we are learning how to do this and interestingly I, I visited there just a few days ago after some months the, a year ago, that was a global crisis, okay, refugee crisis in Bangladesh. Every global expert on refugees flew into Koksa Bazar in Bangladesh. The hotels, the five-star tourist hotels got filled with refugee experts from the whole world, all right? Thousands, literally thousands. When I went there a few days ago, they've all gone. They've gone to Yemen. Bangladesh Rohingyas are not a crisis anymore. We are taking care of them. The people of Bangladesh, the government of Bangladesh are looking after them. In less than a year, we have made a crisis into a still a big problem, but it's not a crisis anymore. We're handling it, and every day we're improving the conditions as we go along. And these are, you know, they're not Bangladeshis. Right? They speak a different language, but they're fellow human beings. And we're let, letting them in, and we're looking after them as fellow human beings. So we can do it. We have the ability to do it. Okay. We'll stop there. Thank you. So, uh, another round. So, please hold your hand up. Um, there's two here in the front. Where there's one at the back there uh, as well. Please hold your hand up um, clearly so I can see them. Um, hello, my name is Virden. I'm doing my exchange here um, from Geneva. Just to build up on the last question. Uh, so you talked about the visibility of women in the political sphere and how they're contributing um, in development. So my question is, what, what is your take on um, microfinance in Bangladesh and the role of women there? Do you think it's maybe essentializing them or, yeah? Mm -hmm. um. I would probably ask uh, like broader uh, questions uh, because we are all studying like developing studies and ideas and some of us are already like uh, development practitioners but some of us will enter into development sphere. So because you have been to all the COP conferences, so based on the Katowice like COP24, what would be the key message from you to us that uh, would apply to our workplace or in which place we will be working? Thank you. Good. <laughs> Okay. 
Hello, I'm Pradnya, uh, studying at IDS. I'm from India. Um, it was a very interesting observation that you, uh, the anecdote that you shared of uh, it's not only about generating awareness, but also actions that people can do with regards to climate. So even a waiter in a hotel, not only aware about it, but can do something about it. So I was just wondering what steps did Bangladesh government or other actors in government, uh, other actors in Bangladesh took to ensure this transition from awareness to action? Because that is, I guess, the most crucial thing that everybody is trying to struggle, you know, struggling to do and something that is very difficult. Should I take this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so let me address the issue of women first. So women and climate change are generally, there's a very strong um, research background and, and paradigm of uh, discussion of characterizing women as particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, which is very true. Um, in Bangladesh, we are leaving that narrative behind a little bit now. What we are trying to do is to figure out how women can be agents of change mm. everywhere. Kids in school, girls in universities, in the, in the uh, um, labor force, in the farms, um, everywhere. At the, at the political level, at the business level, how can we find and promote women as problem solvers, uh, as entrepreneurs, as people that can address the problem and not be victims of the problem and not see themselves as victim of the problem. A, lot, a big shift here is simply a paradigm shift of how you see the problem. If you see the problem as a victim, you have a certain strategy. If you see the problem as not a victim but as an active agent, I'm going to do something about this. Okay? I have a problem but I'm going to do something about this problem and I'm not going to sit back and, and deal with the problem or let it happen then you have a completely different strategy. New avenues of open up. And that's the space we're in. So to answer the question about how do we move from awareness to knowledge, as I said, in, in the, I mentioned earlier that we belong to the group that tries to characterize and monitor uh, and describe and measure adaptation through people's capacity, all right? So level one for us is do you know the problem? Do you accept the problem? Mr. Trump fails level one, all right? He's at level zero. Uh, but in Bangladesh, we're all at level one. So we all understand the problem. Level two is now do you want to do something about it? All right? And when you move from level one to level two, certain things are required. Level one, you can learn passively. You watch television, read newspapers, and you learn. Level two doesn't allow you to do that anymore. You have to go and find out. You have to figure out what can I do? Where can I find out something? You go to a course, go to a seminar, watch a program, go to YouTube, see something. You have to, you have to actively seek knowledge to learn. You're in a learning process now, not just passive awareness creation. And as you go up that learning process, you go, you go up various levels in terms of how knowledgeable you are about solution space. Not about problem space, but solution space. And Doing a master's is like a very high level. Before that, our levels like do a, a short course, go to a workshop, find a group that is doing something and learn with them. Adaptation is a learning by doing process. So you have to do before you can learn. And so you become part of the doers. And, and to answer your question about what's the country doing, everybody's doing something, all right? Everybody's doing something. And you figure out which one you want to join. You join that group and you start doing with them and you learn by doing. And then if you want to be more formally educated, you do a master's, you come to my university and do my master's in climate change and development. Uh, incidentally, just on that, let me just share with you, as of this year, we have a couple of international students, one from Zimbabwe, one from Zambia, so we're, we're trying to make it more international. And we have a couple of government officials who are doing the course, because we run them on weekends. So the lectures are all on our weekend, which is Friday, Saturday. Uh, and a lot of our students have jobs during the week, including these government officials. And so we are now offering scholarships for government officials to come and do the masters with us if they want to do that. So they have to want to learn that. They, that at that point, you want to learn. 
uh, and you have to find out how to learn yourself. And then doing a PhD is even more. But practice and doing, not just theory. You have to do practice and theory. And so in the, in the adaptation knowledge space, again, something you know, re referring to our conversations yesterday in Brussels, a lot of knowledge on adaptation comes from experience, all right? And that's why I'm saying Bangladesh is way ahead of everybody, because we've done things. We haven't always documented them or written papers about them, but we've done them. We have what I call huge amount of experiential knowledge, all right? Other people don't have that yet. And so come and help us document it and formalize it and do it, but we have it, you know, we're doing things. Every farmer and fisherman in Bangladesh is doing something. They may not know climate change, or they may know it vaguely. Uh, in fact, one of the problems we have now in Bangladesh is over-attribution. You know, every time it rains, everybody says climate change. Every time it's, it's a cold wave, everybody says climate change. We learned the climate change. We attribute everything to climate change nowadays. So we've gone, the, the pendulum has swung too far in the opposite direction. We need to bring it uh, back a bit to say that not everything is climate change. Mm -hmm. In fact, Hugh is one of our great uh, champions of uh, advising us not to make everything climate change related, which it isn't, and he's quite right. Did I cover everything, or was, was there anything left? Oh, Katowice, the question on, yes. on the, the UNFCC process. So let me make it a broader question as to what happened in the UNFCC process itself, and then how does that relate to those of us who are not involved in it uh, being part of it. So the, the big breakthrough uh, took place a few years ago in Paris. So we have this thing called the Paris Agreement, where everybody agreed, even though Mr. Trump has withdrawn the US. The US is actually on track to fulfill Obama commitments. So he's not been able to stop them doing things. He just withdraw uh, officially. But it's a bit mad. It's not good to have the US not in it. But uh, in any case, we have the Paris Agreement. We have what needs to be done. And everybody now needs to just figure out from that what is relevant for them. And I'll give you the biggest, in, uh, in my mind, the most uh, fantastic example. She's a girl, I'm sure you've heard about her, 16 years old, lives in Stockholm. She has a, you know, suffers from a, a, a psychological deficit, Greta Thunberg. All right? And she started the school strike. Every Friday she goes to the parliament with a placard and she sits there. And she says something has to be done. And people ridicule her and they ridicule the kids and they say, you know, what do they know? She said, I don't know. But the scientists are telling us what to do. Why the hell aren't you listening to them? All right? Mm -hmm. And thousands of scientists have said, yeah, that's right. She's saying what we need to do. And, and the governments have agreed to do it, but they're not doing it. So they have to do this. And basically, everybody needs to figure out for themselves what their role is for them to play, wherever they happen to be. Because you can't, and particularly for those of you who are from Bangladesh, and I know quite a few of you are here. In Bangladesh, I argue, every Bangladeshi has to know climate change. Okay, you can't escape it. You just have to understand it and figure out what's your role in dealing with the problem from wherever you happen to be. And particularly if you're studying a student, you need to know about that. So our, our master's degree, for example, is about climate change and development. Our students are, 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 are well, after they graduate, will go into the development sector, government, NGOs, private sector, whatever. They will now understand the link with climate change. We're not making them climate experts. They don't even have to have a science degree. They can come from uh, a bachelor's in a, in a uh, humanities. We teach them enough science to understand. What we teach them is the connection between climate and development, not climate per se, not modeling and the hard science of climate. But I think that's what everybody needs to have, some level of understanding of the link between climate change and development. And for a, a development studies uh, center like IDS, uh, I'm very glad to see that they're, they're doing this. I actually had initially, I used to try and come and make them uh, listen to me. They didn't do it uh, all that <laughs> easily in the beginning, but now I'm very glad to see that they are doing it. Can we call it a day or do you want to carry um, on? We have a few more minutes, I think. Shall okay. we, so we take one more okay. round and then, yeah. Okay. So there's a question there. Um, yeah. yeah, my name is Eunice. I'm an IDS PhD student. Uh, my question is to what extent has Bangladesh been uh, collaborating with countries like Netherlands, especially on flood management, and what are the power dynamics and how do they impact or influence what happens? Mm -hmm. and the question now. Uh, thank you for your nice speech. Uh, I am Mushfik. Uh, I am doing masters in climate and development policy. 
I have two questions. Uh, you, in the beginning of your lecture, you uh, told about the fundamentalism you uh, compared to the Pakistan and other Muslim countries. The first question is, what is the relationship between the Islam and climate change? And say my second question is, you already mentioned about that, uh, one, more than one million Rohingya are, come from Myanmar. Mm, they are not migrated, they have to migrate for the ethnic cleansing of Myanmar. So my second question is, uh, what can be the impact of climate change of Bangladesh for the refugee camp in Kutubdia? Okay. Sorry, Kutupalam. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, any more questions from the audience or from online? Okay, do yes. you have the floor? Okay, so we'll, we'll close it there. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, so what India can learn from the Bangladesh or anything you like from India which they have implemented and got successfully and then you want to implement. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Some big questions. <laughs> so, um, great questions. Okay. Let me um, wrap that into this larger question of uh, learning. All right. Uh, so, my take on learning to tackle climate change, particularly focusing on learning to tackle the impacts of climate change, is, as I have mentioned already, a very bottom-up approach where we learn from and enable the most vulnerable people, communities, households, towns, countries, to learn how to tackle climate change and then learn from each other. All right? um, and so in the Gobeshana program that I mentioned, we invite people from around the world to come every conference. We get a few dozen. Next year, we're going to make this into, a, we hope, a much bigger international conference and get lots of people, lots more people coming from around the world to come and learn from us, and we learn from them. Um, at the CBA conference in Addis Ababa, we'll have people from all over the world. We'll be learning from each other. There's a structure to learn from each other. So one of the, the uh, elements of that structure is we don't allow PowerPoints, because you don't learn from PowerPoints. Right? <laughs> we, we enable 400 people for four days together, and we enable everybody to talk to everybody over four days. All right? That's the purpose. You get to know 399 people that you didn't know four days ago by the end of that time. And that's how we structure the event. All right? And so you need a lot more South-South learning. You need uh, structures that enable practitioners who are the real knowledge possessors and not experts speaking on their behalf to be involved in this process and talk to each other in what sometimes is called peer-to-peer -peer learning. So one of the things my center does, as I said earlier, I, I work with the least developed countries group uh, a lot at the global level. We have initiated a few, uh, a couple of years ago, a, um, a, a network of universities from the least developed countries. It's called the Least Developed Countries Universities Consortium on Climate Change, LUCCC for short. At the moment, we have 13 countries in Asia and Africa with universities in these 13 countries, and we're reaching out to the other countries. So even the poorest LDC has a university, has more than one university. Okay? Those institutions are institutions that are meant to build the capacity of their leaders of their country in the future. Those institutions now to, need to be climate aware. They need to have the capacity to be able to give the capacity to their next generation of leaders on climate change. And that's what we're trying to do. We have this network of universities. We're working together. We'll all be in Addis Ababa in a, in a week and a half's time where we're going to discuss how we will do this. We, at the moment, we have no funding, by the way. This is an unfunded program. It's just our own. And it's, we have what we call a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is what we can do with no money, no external money and we've already started that. Plan B is what we could do if we got money from a donor, but the money has to come to do what we want to do, not what the donor wants us to do. So we've got plenty of money to do what the donor wants us to do, but we are not interested in doing, but very little money available to do what we want to do, which we think is, is much more. The donor wants to give money to an international consultant to fly in and help us, all right? We don't need that, all right? We have a lot of capacity that we need to share amongst ourselves. and so. 
what we are trying to do is to develop that peer-to-peer -peer learning, networking across the in, in, uh, practitioners around the world and making that more effective. And because India, Bangladesh are nearby, we can do a lot more of this cross-border sharing and knowledge. And we do. We do quite a lot of work in South Asia uh, uh, through various networks. And then finally, on, on the question of Islam, let me just share uh, an anecdote there. So you know that um, some time ago, the, the Pope brought out the Laudato Si, the, uh, his uh, uh, um, instructions on climate change for the Catholic world on, on a very, very important issue. He took it very seriously. He gave the instructions uh, to the Catholic world on what they had to do. And this went on very well. He's very, very committed to this issue. In response to that, the Islamic uh, global world, which doesn't have a single pope, it has distributed uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, either imams, well-known imams, or uh, heads of universities like Al-Azhar in, in Egypt, uh, uh, traditions of learning. So they got together and they decided that they wanted to do something similar. And they brought together about 30 leaders of the Islamic world to Istanbul about a year and a half, two years ago. And they invited me to go to that uh, meeting and discuss with them how to come up with an Islamic version on this. And I was actually, it opened my eyes. The, the, the links between being a good Muslim and being a good steward of the world, of the earth, is very, very strong. Firstly, there are many, many verses in the Quran that say you must look after the earth, you must look after nature, you must, must not uh, spoil uh, uh, God's creations. Okay, many verses on that. Secondly, it, there is a lot of uh, uh, Islamic teaching, both in the Quran as well as in practice, on uh, helping poor people. So we have this thing called zakat. Okay, zakat is every year two and a half percent of my global assets I should give to charity. I calculate my global asset and I have. I calculate 2.5% and I give it to charity. I give it to people who are less fortunate than me. We can make that allocation to uh, um, uh, vulnerable people. And then the third and final uh, overlay is that many of the poorest communities to the impacts of climate change are in Africa and Asia in countries that are Muslim. Chad in Africa, Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, Pakistan, Bangladesh very large Muslim populations who are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So if we want to give zakat, why don't we help them? We should do that. And so these were the, the, the findings. They came out with an Islamic uh, statement, similar to the, the, the popes on what Muslims should do. And because in Islam, we don't have a pope who tells us what to do. These were advice to people themselves. So as a Muslim, and this speaks to the question about practicing Muslim, I am in charge of practicing it the way I want to practice it. I listen to different people telling me how I should practice, but I decide how I practice. I, somebody else doesn't decide for me. They can advise me. They may not like what I do, but I decide. And so if I take these um, uh, advice into account, I should practice these tenets of Islam and be aware of the climate change problem and try and help. And I'll give you one interesting example. Um, we worked for many years in Bangladesh with uh, the large international NGOs, Oxfam, uh, uh, CARE, ActionAid, uh, uh, etc. One of them is the Islamic Relief. Islamic Relief is a big international NGO based in the UK, headquartered in Birmingham. And we, we work with them on community-based adaptation. These are the early years of community-based adaptation, helping uh, NGOs who are doing development with poor communities think about climate vulnerability and how they can do adaptation as part of their work. This has now happened, as I said. That, that's where the genesis of the, uh, the community of practice on community-based adaptation uh, arose. But the, in the Islamic relief uh, uh, arena, a very interesting thing happened. Uh, at one point in time, the, in the UK, this is when David Cameron became Prime Minister. Under the British uh, government policy for many, many years, under DFID, DFID has a list of about 20 international NGOs who regularly get money from DFID in the order of several million pounds. I forget what the list is called, but it's a list of DFID preferred NGOs, and every year they get money to do their work. David Cameron, when he became Prime Minister, said, we'll give you the money, but there's a condition attached. You have to demonstrate that the people in Britain like you, know you, and support you. And so you have to raise money from the people of Britain, and we will give you matching grants. Whatever you raise from the UK citizen, we will give you a matching grant up to five million pounds. Right? 
So everybody had to go out with their tins and you know, collect money from uh, donors. What Islamic Relief did, they came to us, we talked to them about this, and we helped them do this. They designed a program during the month of Ramadan. And on Islamic Relief, uh, Islamic media, there's radios, there's te television stations, there's newspapers, they advertised for the whole month of Ramadan a program on community-based adaptation in Muslim countries for Muslims that Islamic Relief. So if you give your zakat money to us, it will go for climate change adaptation in poor countries with poor uh, Muslim countries for poor people in those countries. And so it's eligible for uh, zakat donations. In one month, they raised nine million pounds from the British Muslim community. And then the UK government had to give them five million as a matching grant. So they had 14 million pounds out of this sense of doing something good with the money that you have. So involving people in various ways, that comes from awareness, okay? So a level of awareness, linking it to values, linking it to morality, linking it to what is a good thing to do, and then finding a good place to do that on, on climate as well. Maybe I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That sounded like a good place to stop. Um, and uh, thank you again, Salim, for um, sharing your knowledge and experience and insights. Um, I don't want to claim to, you know, um, summarize all that, but a couple of words that stuck in my mind is that, you know, you need all the technical capacity, you need funds, you need good governance, but above all, you need to change the narrative. And I think that the story you're telling is, is about that, changing the narrative, looking at people, women uh, and, and everybody as agents. And I think if there's anything in there we can learn, I think that's, that's a key, key thing in what we all have to do. And I take your point about PowerPoint. I think we all could <laughs> get away with using less PowerPoint. And I, I just to, start, to finish off, I'm always so um, impressed by your optimism. And I keep, <laughs> ask you every, every year, are you an optimist about the future? And I think every year you say something like, uh, Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's, that's a great thing. And I, uh, particularly after sitting through 25 COPs, mm -hmm. I, I'm very impressed that you've managed to keep that optimism <laughs> going because it hasn't been plain sailing. Can, can I respond to that quickly? Yes. <laughs> so two points. Firstly, people do ask me this, you know, why do you come to the COP every year when nothing happens? Yeah. And I say the reason I'm able to do that is only two weeks out of 52. All right, so two weeks out of 52, I can go there and listen to the endless talk, 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 talk into all night, no decisions. They, they argue about a comma for three hours, all right? It's insane. But then the other 50 weeks, I don't have to be involved in that. I can do something more concrete on the ground. So recovery in 50, yeah, 50 weeks. Exactly, and the, the other sense of optimism is this, you know, working with young people, that fills me with optimism. It's their world that we have destroyed. And if I can help them solve the problem, then that to me is, is good enough. If we manage to solve it, that's a bonus. Mm. But if we try to solve it, that's something good enough. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you.